Welcome to the Sean Trey Show. I have a really interesting guest with me today. Now, would you like to tell people who you are and what you do? <laughs> My name is Chris Henderson. I'm the owner of Hindi Amps, and we build studio gear, all kinds of microphones, uh, mic pre's, EQs, compressors, etc. Micro, uh, just all of it. And um, I also run a studio, which you can kind of see behind me. And so we'll do all kinds of tracking designing of soundscapes or mixing mastering I master for a bunch of labels and so forth and so yeah just pretty much anything with audio and a lot of times video as well we'll just that's what we do that's really awesome no no let's let's take it back. I got so many questions for you but let's take it back to how did how did you get into music let's start there uh I think the way that I would describe that would be I've been doing music pretty much my whole life. So I, I grew up playing piano. I was playing piano before I remember anything. Like that's one of the first memories I have. And so I just, I don't know, music's been part of my system ever since. And I have just, I mean, I've played in bands all across the, I mean, I'm in the Houston area, Houston, Texas. And so I've played in um, basically every club in Houston at some point when I was in high school. and early college and then you know going to college trying to do the studious thing and get a degree in something or whatever and uh eventually i just kind of made my way back to music and i just it's never been out of my system if no, that makes that, sense that's, that's awesome so. that's really cool and the uh, that your earliest memories were like playing piano i uh I think that's powerful in parents unfortunately i'm not good enough at piano <laughs> for that to seem true to a lot of people and, and I, it's one of those things that I figured out along the way. It's like, there are people who are musicians. Yeah. And then there are people who are sound designers or audio engineers. In other words, I never was committed to an instrument long enough or deeply enough to become an mm. expert. I was always committed to music and committed to sound and committed to that kind of thing. I just didn't know the difference when you're taking piano lessons, you know, when you're in third grade or something, you know, <laughs> it's like, no one tells you these things, but you gotta, you gotta learn somewhere. And so you just you gain experience with it. And then you start figuring out who you actually yeah. are. I like that. I, um, I, I, the, some of those, the, those multi instrument, multi instrumentalists blow me away though. And it, it's just my wife, mm -hmm. my wife had a show at this one theater and, um, the guy putting the show together was like setting up the, 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 the not an orchestra, but you know, the musicians, the band, and it was like, you know, 15 different people. And, you know, and he was like, he was, he's on the piano and he was a gifted piano pianist. And then the, the guitarist was doing something. He's like, man, not like that. Give me the guitar. And he just, <laughs> he just rocks on the guitar. And like, and then the bassist was like kind of messing up his lines. And he's like, let me shake. Boom, boom. And it was just like, he literally was grabbing each instrument and he wasn't doing it in an arrogant way. It was just literally like this guy was this phenomenally mm -hmm. talented musician and he wanted things to sound the way he wanted it when he was composing this show. It was, just blew me away. Yeah. And I was just like, I'm sitting there going, it's it's amazing. <laughs> I've practiced guitar for 15 years and I suck. <laughs> you know, <it's> like, <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. I love it. I love the instrument. Yeah, you know, it's not great. But it's yeah, and it's interesting. It's interesting, kind of going with what you're saying, because like I, I play guitar as well, but I can't. I, I try and call myself a rhythm guitarist, but I'm not even really a rhythm guitarist. I just I find myself saying. I think I'm a delay player <laughs> who happens to use a guitar. <laughs> like that's just my style. I, I don't know why. It just I, I'm I'm far more interested in the notes that I'm not playing that are still ringing out, and how to make those all work together. Which and it's just every instrumentalist they or like on a piano. I like the after I've played the notes, the resonance oh, that yeah. happens, and just sinking into that. I don't like playing all of the notes per se. The notes are a means to an end for me. <laughs> And so it's, it's kind of like what you're saying. It's, 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 we think of instruments as a singular thing of how good am I at playing all these yeah. notes, but the real musicians, the real ones that feel music at a deep level, they're, they're far more interested than just simply playing mm -hmm. notes. You know? I, I, I say it this way. There's this one guitarist I know, and I've met many amazing guitarists, but this one guy, he doesn't play guitar. He speaks guitar. Like, like mm -hmm. when I, when he picks up a guitar and it can be any guitar, it can be the cheapest guitar on the planet. And he makes 
There was this story about Michael Shoemaker, the, the, the Ferrari driver, right? And he was mm -hmm. late to get to the airport. And so he had a taxi pick him up and the taxi was not going to get them there on time. And he's like, can I drive? And the taxi driver's like, sure. <laughs> Like, <laughs> what am I going to tell yeah, you now? It's like he was, and they said that he took this taxi to the absolute brink. And when they got to the airport, it was like, <laughs> totally enough time, you know? And the taxi driver, and I remember this interview of the taxi driver. Taxi driver's like, I didn't know my car could do that. <laughs> like, I didn't, didn't know that this was possible, <laughs> that this vehicle could be taken mm -hmm. to this level. And, and, and that's what some of these people have the ability to so pull out from that instrument everything mm. that it's capable of you know it's, just, it's amazing yeah. stuff that's a good way to put it, 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 it you know as as someone you got into and and this is something that i was i was talking to my friend tim about how did you get into i'm i'm an analog purist i i, I keep sitting here i went to the zoo today and i i took a bunch of rolls of film you know and it, <laughs> I love analog and it, for, for different reasons in, in, in film than sound. But how did you, what got you into making these compressors and other, other types of, uh, of equipment? How did you get into that? Uh, I think it, it just goes back into the fact that doing music for a very, very long time you very quickly start to learn what you love and what you don't love, your style versus what's not your style, what you appreciate versus what you don't mm. appreciate. And I found that I appreciate and I love just beautiful tone, great tone and context dependent in the same way that an artist finds kind of what they love. And, and that could be multiple different things depending upon, you know, what their mood is or what day it is or whatever else. And, and so they'll go on quests for finding the way to make that a realized thing. So for instance, I, I'm in the studio, I'm trying to record guitars and I'm just getting furious because I have all of these, the best amps that anybody would ever want in the world and I'm just not finding the tones that appeal to me. It's just not it. Mm. And I'm realizing all I'm doing is just taking other people's vision for sound and trying to make that my own and that's just not gonna work. And when I was in high school, I was a bit of a screw up I mean, I still am, but <laughs> I was a real screw up in high school. And I, and I ended up taking an electronics class because it sounded way more fun than, uh, than any other class that had any kind of academic value. Uh, that being said, I love academics and I love learning, but I just didn't like learning what yes. I had to learn in high school. Yes. <laughs> and so I took an electronics class for two years and I absolutely loved it because the professor, he wasn't interested in teaching us the theory of, okay, so here is how a capacitor does this, and this is how it reacts to this in an electrical circuit and blah, 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 and basically taking tests. Our tests were how far did the capacitor blow up across the room <laughs> when you That's shot awesome. it with too much voltage. And, and so, awesome. and, and how bad was that smell when you did that? Like, it, it, it was funny because it was a very hands-on kind of mm -hmm. thing where you learn electronics the hard way but the fun way yeah. so oh how much did that hurt when you shocked yeah. yourself you know that kind of thing and and so you very quickly start realizing well i don't want that to happen again how do i fix that and and and, and so i had a little bit of that background but i didn't have all of the mathematical technical portion of it in that particular time really all i got was the 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 lack of fear of messing with electronics That's awesome. and and that kind of carried over when i was in the studio i thought okay you know what I can go teach myself how to do a lot of, I mean, most of this, most of this tube stuff that I'm dealing with, we're talking 1920s, 30s, yeah. 40s technology for crying out loud. I, there's, there are so many books out there. I could go teach, teach myself. I have an internet for God's sake. Why don't mm -hmm. I use it? And, uh, and so that's what I did. I just, I just started trying to learn and I just started buying stuff and failing and succeeding and failing. And, and, and I started figuring out why people made decisions that they made for certain design points and honestly where in history the great tone turned into what i consider not to be great tone mm. and most of the stuff that is held in great high regard today as far as some of the all-time classics the best of the best in the history of ever are designs that were very different than how you would do it from say even the 60s 70s on mm. 
and, and I, I could go into the weeds with all of that kind of stuff. But I started realizing, why do I hate most of the gear that I'm that I have access to today? It doesn't matter the price point. I just I just don't like it. And it's because I started realizing that most people who design are a either copying designs or B, they're coming at it from mathematics engineering first, which is let's get rid of harmonic distortion because that's bad. And I realize that human hearing loves distortion. And I don't mean like, you know, let's distort a guitar amp. I'm talking about you have a pure signal and then you add harmonic content to that signal or a little bit of a distorting of the signal in order to achieve a, um, a thicker, fuller, richer sound than maybe you would have captured with just a basic microphone. Uh, you talk about film, it's the same concept. Like what is it you love about film? Well, you don't love film because it gives you like an iPhone picture of the world around you. You love film because it distorts the signal in a way that is pleasing to the eyes. And the funny thing about humanity is that our eyes and our ears love distorted signals far more than quote unquote undistorted yeah. signals. Like uh, a guitar amp, if most people would say if they've had a lot of experience in classic amps all the way up to modern amps, um, if I let you listen to a bunch of amps, you would usually pick a single ended class A amp because it just sounds fuller, richer than life mm -hmm. in a sense. And yet, 90 plus percent of all energy used is wasted in heat. It's the most inefficient amplifier design mm -hmm. you can possibly come up with. Same thing with vintage lenses. Like I, I, I love cameras and lenses and so forth. And we all we only use vintage lenses like 1960s projector, Russian projector lenses. Those are my favorites. Why? Because they have lead in them. And what does lead do to light? It refracts it in certain ways that enhances the colors. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful what it can do. We don't really use lead anymore in, in lenses. And I just, I've been unsatisfied even at the highest price points today because it just doesn't quite have the same mojo to it for lack of better term. No. Anyway, so it, it's really a, a delving into human psychology and figuring out that humans don't appreciate mathematically perfect or engineered perfection. We really love for the right distortion to happen. I, I, sometimes I'll use an example like, um, you look at a sitcom, right? Sitcom from the 80s or, or even even modern day. Yeah, great cameras. It, it just looks okay. Mm -hmm. it just it is what it is. But then you compare it to something like Lord of right. the Rings or uh, or Braveheart or something that is just larger than life cinema. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not because you captured a more accurate mm -hmm. image. It's because you captured an image that's enhanced with distortion. Were, distortion of the have visual you realm. There was there was the other day I was. Uh, one of the last times I went to take a look at the big electronic store and I was looking at all the brand new, super huge, beautiful 4k TVs. And they were playing some of the movies that I grew up with that I loved. And I was like, it looked like a freaking student film or something. You know, it, it didn't look right yep, because when yep. it, I know it, it was going. like <laughs> so picture perfect and I'm seeing everything. And I was like, I don't want to see it that perfect, man. I wanted to see that like, that imperfection, that distortion, that all that, you know, like the movie theater where it was literally coming on a projector, you know, coming through a projector and through the film mm -hmm. and it was. You want to see 24, yeah, you want to see 24 frames per second. You don't want to see this this 24 frames upscaled to a 60 yeah, smoothing, right. which looks like a soap opera yes. effect. It looks it awful. Looks Why do they do that? It's so horrible. Yeah. It's so horrible. I'm, like what? <laughs> I, I mean, I'm okay with it when it comes to watching sports. Yes. Okay. Granted. But I'm not okay with my films no. looking like that. No. It's so horrible. <laughs> I watched it and I was just like, and it, I couldn't put my finger on it. I was like, this is just wrong. It's <laughs> something is not right. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, yeah. and now there was one photographer and I, I don't, I, I, I really respect him because he's a phenomenal photographer and he was talking about his process and he's like, well, one of the first things I do is add a film grain. <laughs> Why don't you just shoot with film? <laughs> you know, and I was like, <laughs> you know, and granted, yeah. you know, he, he couldn't because he's working on professional shoots and he needs, he needs to do volume because, you know, it would be mm -hmm. prohibitively expensive for him to shoot on film every day. But, you know, yeah. One of the first things he did was when he finished shooting, he immediately threw that filter on there to create that effect because that's the look that was, you know, that he was going mm -hmm. for. And it because, yeah. again, crystal clear images are not what we want. 
you know and every time i see like mm -hmm. you know this new camera with an even bigger sensor i'm almost like <laughs> it's going to be even more like details that i don't want to have you know yeah i will say that there are ways to mitigate some of that so like in other words you can leverage the new super duper sensor and everything else that's that that's kind of the secret that we've discovered is we were looking at some of the films that we loved watching and they're using all the new reds and, and aries and everything else but here's what they did they're getting lenses yeah. from yep. way back and it's because it, it, it what it does to the bokeh and the colors it doesn't allow everything to be super sharp because it's never going to be super sharp in those old lenses, unless it's like a Zeiss, you know, upper yeah, right. or something. But we we actively search for those lenses that warp mm. an image, that kind of change the, the the fluidity of it in a sense, and that bring out colors in a way that don't look saturated. They just look mm -hmm. good. And a lot of times when we film with it, it is completely flat. I mean, because we do the, the yeah. vlog look. But again, even when like, you have to add saturation to it, because it's just a flat mm -hmm. image just from the lens awesome. and um and, and we've just found that there's some magic happening with with again those old 1960s 70s even 50s uh, especially the russian lenses because they weren't really great at copying all of the uh, germans and the germans were all about precision we're got to get it perfect you know that's where your zeiss yeah. is that that's where they're coming from okay well the russians copy it and it turns into an all-time classic because of the messing up of the image <laughs> So they screw up the copy and it's like, oh my gosh, this is perfect. You know? Someone was telling me, what are, this, you're not the first person to mention these Russian lenses. I, 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 it's a video that I haven't edited. So I don't remember which one of the people I'd interviewed that said this. And he's like, he loves these Russian lenses. But one of the funny things is, is he was doing research and he's like, there is a ton of banned substances in some of these. And he's like, and there was like, he's yeah. like, one of them was like stromium. And he's like, you don't want to be, or I don't know what it was, but it was like literally a radioactive chemical. He's like, this lens is radioactive yeah. and they were just like you know because they yeah. were using it's the ussr man it's what they use to clean stuff yeah know? in fact some of the japanese ones too um so like the actually what the takamar i don't know if you've ever I heard have, of takamar have, lenses yeah. but um but there's a few of them i have a 50 uh, millimeter takamar that it has radioactivity to it and it definitely stays across the room <laughs> i mean it's not going to harm you whatsoever if you're more than like three feet yeah. away from it but if you know you have it sit next to you all the time, well, eventually it'll start seeping yeah. in. But you get more radiation from the you know just from the no, sky. No, totally. Or actually, well, the there was like I remember in so. university, um, I, I had this really interesting. We had like these survey classes, and I was I was an art you know I was a bachelor of arts, so they were like we just got to do these basic science classes. And so some of them were phenomenal, but the intro to physics class was probably the coolest class I have ever had in my life because the professor knew mm -hmm. no one was going to stay awake. No one. And he just wanted to make people <laughs> see how cool physics was. And like, so he would have all mm -hmm. these really interactive. Honestly, it felt a whole lot more like the kids, like science museum. than like <laughs> he, was, he, was just, he understood, like he understood his job give these kids a fun time while they learn some about science. And one of the coolest things he did was he brought um, a Geiger meter, like, you know, the test radiation. Mm -hmm. and, so, and then he brought a bunch of like of cleaning products from the supermarket, like household cleaning products. Oh, and he wow. was like, check this out. <laughs> <laughs> it was just like well, come some of the cleaning products. Oh, it was Lord. like, I, I don't know what brand it was, but it was like, um, so one of those powders that you use to scrub the sink, it wasn't one of the brand names ones, but he was mm. like, it was just, it was seriously radioactive. Yeah. He's like, you don't know. Yeah. It's like, it's out there. It, yeah. No, it's so true. It's so true. It's like everyone thinks, you know, it'd be so much fun to explore the stars, you know, go <laughs> right. into space and be like, well, until they figure out how to shield you from the radiation in the cosmos, <laughs> like we live on earth. It's not perfectly tuned for human life. It's just the least deadly yeah. to us it takes 80 years to kill you on earth whereas it would take you seconds everywhere else there was, there was this really interesting story i'm totally off music topic but there was a really interesting story about that like with um what was it in in the vietnam war there was like this one event like suddenly like 600 mines ocean mines just exploded and the u.s army was like what was this it was just like all over that the u.s had laid they just immediately were detonated and like the u.s was like immediately like we need to study what is this what caused this what they found out was it was just these 
some of the most intense solar flares ever on record in like, I think it was like 72 or something. It was, I, I read the story the other day. It was really interesting. And what they found is they were like, if any astronauts had have been on a moon, moon mission at that moment, done. Like it was such an wow. intense solar flare that I'll send you the information when we're done. I'll find it and send it to you. No, that sounds amazing. Yeah, I love that stuff was, like that. Like, That's <laughs> nuts, you know? They're like one of the most intense solar flares, wow. solar storms on record. And it was so intense that 600 ocean mines just went, you know, fried the surface. That's, I mean, <laughs> That's not okay. <laughs> if we got hit by something like that now, it'd be crazy, man. So. Yeah. Um, goodbye, yeah. GPS. <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> yeah. So. So you, you kind of go about how, how about you're coming out with really, what was the, the first, um, first analog device that you built? What was the first? Uh, it was a guitar. guitar amp. Amp. It was a guitar amp. It was, yeah. It was, um, a single ended EF 86 into a six V six. Um, just, I don't know. I wanted something that would be super punchy have a little bit of a combo of a Voxy slash Fender sound, um, hence the combination of the 6v6 with the EF86. Mm -hmm. And uh, really didn't know what I was doing. I just kind of had some basic ideas. And honestly, the first idea ended up working. Awesome. And it became the first uh, thing that I actually offered and sold. And it's one of those things where it's like it sets you up for failure yeah. because you just haphazardly put it together turns out i picked all the right components That's the right awesome. voltages and everything just out of pure stupid dumb luck and, uh, and i'm like well this is easy <laughs> my gosh why would i the next five projects are utter failures right before this i i i, I kind of mistake my wife wants me to have family time in the evenings so i made her a promise that i will do these three days a week and so i kind of stack them right and so mm -hmm. I was talking to this DOP just before we, we got on the car call. And he was talking about how two things that he said that were really interesting. One was the failing forward is a big part of his life and his career is the idea of just mm -hmm. failing forward. And he, he, he was like, <clears throat> and it, he made this statement like jump, just jump. And then he didn't say learn to fly once you jump. He said jump and build your wings as you're falling. And mm -hmm. I like that because yeah. it's like so often we think yeah. jump and I'm going to spread my wings and fly. No, you don't have wings, <laughs> but you can learn. You can yeah. learn to make stuff, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. It's that I, I completely agree with that philosophy. hundred thousand percent. You don't know what you don't know. If you try and figure out everything before you even start, you, you're going to end up with nothing but failure in my opinion, because you don't know what you don't know. So just get in with the expectation that everything that it costs you is the price of learning. This is your university tuition yeah. in a sense. And, um, and as you go, if you have the kind of brain that you just naturally love to invent and create things and solve problems, you'll figure it out and you'll come up with new things that you never could have dreamed of because you didn't even know they were right. problems. So you don't know what you don't yeah. know. It, 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 and I think so. that so often we, you can't let that, people will live inside that fear. Cause like that was, that was the question. I, 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 I am not technology. I'm, I'm actually quite good with technology, technology, but like I, electronics have always like really like intimidated me. And that was an interesting point that you had, you took that class and you were like, we had this guy here. So I just, I, I have to get an electrician in cause I just had a light go out in my room. Right. And the last guy that we had, the guy mm -hmm. that we had install the light, I was like, you know, he came to our house and he was working with all the electricity. And I was like, and he didn't kill the circuit breaker when he started working on the stuff in my room. He was just like working and he's like, I was like, Don't, do, do you need to kill the electrical circuit in here? <laughs> this was his point. He's like, I make better decisions when the power's on. I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> 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 so, but I mean, it was like, wow, well, that sounds terrifying because I think you could die. But like, it, but it was like his thing was he wasn't afraid because he knew his limits. He knew what would, you know, mm. and, and it was by trial and error. He uh -huh. had made the mistakes before. And now at this point, he, he kind of just wasn't, he wasn't afraid. You know, for me, I'm just like, all I'm thinking in my, th my head is like, 
my mom saying, don't put a fork in the wall, you know? <laughs> <laughs> still good still advice. Still great advice, you know? <laughs> and so, but it was interesting that, the you know, with, with some of these things, it's like the knowledge comes as you practice. But I was sitting there when yeah. I was prepping for this interview thinking about, like, we just had one of our mics go out. And, and, and I was talking to, to my wife and I was like, and I'm no way I'm going to try to take it apart and figure out what's wrong because it's beyond my, my skill level and it's, it's a newer mic. But the thing was, is it was like, I knew that it, it couldn't have been, it's, it's not super complicated. It's like with electronics, you can trace the pathway and find it, It's quite, um, kind of linear if that makes sense like you can figure yeah yeah well it depends yeah it depends on the design but some of them can be quite complicated at least to diagnose mm. because they do some bizarre things at times and not with only new that stuff but especially especially microphones when you're when you're dealing with the capsule oh, really? like good luck testing the voltages on that unless you have some pretty refined mm. equipment because most of the voltages are theoretical in many ways it's wild and so it's one of those where like can measure it and it's like why is it one volt well it's actually not it's being reflected at you know 40 volts, but you're not going to be able to measure that because the act of measuring actually changes the reading, uh, much like quantum mechanics. Awesome. It's like, how do you, how do you uh, observe the electrons? Well, you don't. <laughs> well, can't we measure them? Uh, not really. I mean, sort of, eh, because the act of measuring actually changes the That's results. Awesome. So, but that so, was that was again my thing is like, I, I didn't even know how to wrap my mind around conceptualizing something like this and so going from building your own amp to making a I got a microphone i'm working on awesome. right now <laughs> that's awesome how, how did you go from building an amp to creating these amazing pieces of hardware that you know it, like when i talked to my friend tim and i told him about you know i was gonna interview he's like dude i've worked i've worked with a michelangelo it is awesome he loved it and like and he was like too he also was like how did you get to the point of like starting to craft these really amazing machines from just the amp, you know, because that's, there is a definitely a leap in, in technology and in, in, mm -hmm. in skill level to get to that point. Well, it goes, again, it goes back to exactly what we were talking about where you don't know what yeah. you don't know. And so believe it or not. So this, this is what's interesting is, I moved from guitar amp into multiple guitar amps. I mean, I, I designed a bunch of them. That's what I was at yeah. first was yeah. indie amps. It was an amp company. Like I, I built amps. And then I started looking at like, man, I need preamps because I just really don't appreciate basically every preamp I have with the exception of maybe three, like the Telefunken V76, one of my favorites. There's an old RCA from the 50s that I really like too. Uh, but the modern stuff, anywhere from the 50s on, I'm just usually not a fan of because I don't like their design aesthetic as far as sonic design aesthetic. So I thought, you know, I'm really liking these guitar amps. I like them more than my Mesas and everything else. And, hmm, what would it be? Like, what is the difference really with Mike Pre? And then I started looking. And I'm like, well, there's not really a lot of difference other than some extra stuff that people would add on from an engineering perspective to lower the THD content, which I'm not a fan of. Okay, so leave that out. Or what else? Well, you need to somehow get the mic to talk to it. So that's an impedance matching problem. So you got to figure out transformers or something like that. I'm not doing op amps because I hate op amps. It's like a gazillion different transistors in one little chip that does nothing but screw up sound as far as I'm mm. concerned. Yes, I offended a lot of designers, but I don't <laughs> care. I know what I like. And, uh, and so it, it, it kind of turned into, let's take the little gorilla, leave out the output stage put another tube that I know quite well, the, the 12AU7, which is a triode, on the back end that gives me my final amplification, but leave the EF86, modify some values, but let's figure out a transformer that works in front of it, let's figure out one that works behind it, and then just see what it sounds like. And from there, I can start tweaking and I can start messing with things. And so the first preamp I ever designed was the Rembrandt, mm -hmm. which is, it's changed a little bit over time just to tweak the values and add some more options and things like that. but. The general idea of it is still very similar to that guitar amp that I built, the the, um, the little gorilla is what I called it. And and it's interesting because it's like mic pre's are not all that different than basic guitar amps, mm. but yet at the same time, there's a lot of differences that you have to account for. But it's the same concept. You're amplifying yeah. a sound. You have to capture it. So the microphone captures it or the, the, the you know, you plug in a, a bass or a guitar or something. You got to capture the sound 
And I very quickly figured out, I like to capture everything that I'm hearing in the room. If I hear it and it sounds amazing in the room, I need to capture that in the finest detail I can and add a little bit of sonic enhancement as is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Or if I want to distort the crap out of it, I can do that too. But that's the general aesthetic is I don't want to lose content on the capturing mm -hmm. phase. I want to capture all of it. And then if I want to screw with it, that's what I do in the mixing yeah. phase. And if I want to use hardware to do it, great. If I want to use software, whatever, I don't care. But that's a mixing decision. And so I just, I started trying to go down the road of understanding how do you capture all of the detail, all of the dynamics, all of the EQ, all of everything that that mic is putting out and capture what's happening in the energy in that room. Because everything that I had up until that point at any price point was just not doing mm -hmm. it. And, and again, I learned reasons for that and having to do with negative feedback looping and things like that. And so I finally just, I just threw out the, the newer textbooks and went back to the old school and just said, screw it. I'm just going to start jacking around with this. No rules other than don't blow up the tubes and don't blow up the capacitors. Keep it safe. But once you're in safe realm, no rules. Mm -hmm make it sound like the room. And so I, I, I do a lot of mastering. And so I would, I would always, I always have my mastering rig up, you know, in my studio. And so it's when I'm listening to things, I'm not listening like a guitarist in a room mm -hmm. because your ears compress, your follicles, you know, like you can't hear it after the first burst, yeah. right? So everything has to be mic'd up. Everything has to be isolated. The microphone has to be, you know, precisely set, keep all variables. And it has to be true in double blind studies. So in other words, I assume my gear is less quality and doesn't sound as good until proven wrong by double line mm -hmm. studies. And once that happens, then I can speak authoritatively. Okay, well, most people enjoy this. I enjoy this too. Okay, we have something. Um, but, but I think that it's, it's a step where I don't start with the equations. Mm -hmm. I start with, what am I looking for? What's the sound I'm looking for? All right, start putting things together. What what does that sound like? That's not quite it. Okay, what does this sound? Oh, that's getting there. So let's change something. And like in other words, it's an experimental approach on purpose because I let my ears do the talking. Yeah. It's the same concept with compression. Why is it most people suck with compression, especially when they first start off? It's because they're compressing with their eyes. They're looking at the meters. Mm -hmm. Well, I very quickly learned I suck at compressing with my eyes, just like most people, because when you're on Spotify, nobody sees compression on Spotify. All they do is hear it, okay? So I don't care what your compressor says. So I would like tape up my VU meters, like so I can't see them. And it would force me to listen. Close your eyes and just listen. Learn them, understand them. It's the same thing with gear designing. What am I looking for? Is it sounding like what the room is sounding like? Is it sounding like the piano that I'm recording? Is it sounding like the acoustic guitar, but just better? Because most of the time, I just was not able to get that with, with, other, with other gear. And... And again, I keep going back to, it's just a difference in approach. I'm approaching it from a musician who doesn't give a crap what my schematic says. I don't care. I don't care if I impress an engineer who says, wow, that's a beautifully elegant design. Well, most of my designs are not beautifully elegant. In fact, they look really backwards. They're inefficient and they just look, why would you, why would you ever do something? In fact, I've had engineers ask me that. Why would you do that? Do you realize that there's a way better way to accomplish that? To which I respond, yeah, I know, I tried. And it sounded like crap because you're cleaning up the harmonics and I'm not about that. Mm. And anyway, it's just, it's just that type of a design. So when you look at you know, Michelangelo, Michelangelo is an absolutely backwards idiotic design from an engineering standpoint. But that's because I wanted to accomplish building an EQ that is easy to use, but that can also be complicated. And I wanted to be able to do the impossible, which is when you turn up a band, it sounds better. Mm -hmm. Whereas in most... EQs, they tell you, no, no, you really want to turn them mm -hmm. down. Well, I, that's stupid. I'm not using, utilizing my tubes at that mm -hmm. point. You know, I want to get a little bit of saturation. So let's incentivize people to turn it up. And, um, but again, that kind of approach leads you into a very different design world that displeases a good portion of mathematicians and engineers. There, there was something you said there that I, I think is so of, of utmost importance. You, you touched on it multiple times in different ways you know what you like you know what sounds good it, it, there was um in, in my last episode uh, interview with my friend tim and we were talking about how we were talking about how he would do when he was buying he wanted to get a, a mic preamp and one of the things he did was he went and tested a bunch of them and he didn't look he was doing some audio tests and he just listened 
because he's like, when you start reading up on stuff, when you start doing your research on stuff and you start reading what other people say. And at the end of the day, he's like, he got a bunch of audio samples from these different mic preamps. And then he listened, which one do mm -hmm. I like the sound of? And what was interesting was he was like, it was consistent. It was always consistent that he he would like the sound from certain things. So he his he was very consistent in what he liked, but it it wasn't there wasn't like one was super expensive and then one was crazy cheap. And he's like, well, I guess I like the sound of whatever that is. But it mm -hmm. had a tonal quality that was special to him, and, and he appreciated. It. And I think that that's one of the important things is like whether you are a filmmaker or a painter. I, I, the, the one that uh, the the episode that I'm posting tonight after we finish up here, I'm posting a, a watercolorist, you know, and he is really it's a really special episode where he talks about his journey from being a storyboard artist in Hollywood into becoming a watercolor painter. And, That's cool. Watercolor is beautiful because it has those and like one of the things that he points out, and this is a really cool concept. You are not trying to turn apples into apples it's like you're trying let me pick a better examples i'm trying to think of something i know in a different language you're translating something so you're taking something and turning it into almost a different language you know it's you are literally changing it into a different medium and it's not about trying to accurately represent it it's about adding a certain level of emotion and feeling that are things that you want to add to it. It's not about let's get a perfect, accurate representation. All right, let's have it sound the same, but I want to make it sound better or different or add colors or add things to it. That's what you're doing. That's your job. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that you're bringing that up. Um, so almost all of my studio gear, I decided I wanted to name after painters. And um, the reason, one of my majors in college was, was actually That's painting. Awesome. And so... I, I understand completely what you're talking about because watercolor was one of the ones that I never understood at first. Like I just didn't get it. Um, I understood oil and I, I could get around acrylic so long as it was like trying to mimic oil, not the, not the flat, mm -hmm. you know, flat kind. But I just didn't know what to do with non-textured right. painting mediums. I just couldn't get it. Like it didn't make any sense to me until I, I was talking with um, a, a fellow major who was doing that type of thing. And he really started to make a lot of sense because he was describing it like you were saying. It, 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 you're, you have a different meshing of the colors when, when they're wet together. That you, like it's, it's, a whole, it's like a totally different mm -hmm. discipline rather than oil, where it's a lot of times with oil, if you want to give the look that you're going for, you mix colors, yes, but mixing colors isn't the point. Typically, the better ones are going to use almost solid colors on yes. top. And so it's the three dimensionality of it that, that starts to really come alive. You might see that with like a, um, with like a Van Gogh and, um, but watercolor is radically different. It's a whole different kind of look and seeing him do, he used to do like photorealism oh, with watercolors. Man, it's not absolutely yeah. blew my mind. I have no idea how he did that. I'm sure he's like super wealthy and famous because he was unbelievable at it. Whereas I was just kind of like a Jackson Pollock of, <laughs> 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 but, uh, but it, yeah, it's, you're right. It's that, that is such an interesting discipline when you understand it and when you know what you're going for. And so like for me with, um, with my studio gear, I like to name each one after the artist that I feel like it, it kind of captures in a sense. So like when uh, the Rembrandt, why did I name it Rembrandt? Well, because Rembrandt to me was always about capturing not photorealism. That's not, that's not really what it is, but it's almost like more than a photorealist yeah. can do. So how do you capture just this gritty emotion to it? That's really raw, but beautiful at the same time. And that's kind of how I envisioned what Rembrandt was doing sonically or, or Michelangelo. Why did I call it Michelangelo? Because Michelangelo has these huge sweeping, strokes and coloration and, and visionary sort of experience where you can change a lot with a little effort in multiple different directions. And that's what Michelangelo does is it's broad strokes. It's really just big, bold style. And um, yeah, it's just, I, I completely resonate with what you're talking that's about. Awesome. There's the, the creative arts have such a, um, 
modern education. I think that one of the things this last year with COVID has allowed me to do with my daughter is I've had to, I've been homeschooling my daughter. In addition to um, <laughs> doing my video work and running things for my wife and I'm not mixing for us, but I'm doing all of our vocal captures because we've been in lockdown. And so I'm the one who's helping her record her vocals for, for new projects and stuff. And then I'm doing my work. I'm also homeschooling my daughter. And at first I was putting a ton of energy into all these different things. But then I kind of boiled it down to a couple of things. One, I watched what my daughter was good at. And, 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 and it was really fun. Mm. Like, I just kind of tossed the, the, the book out the window, like that education needs to look like this and this. And I, I have a great curriculum that I'm doing from Australia. Not going to lie. Great curriculum that helps with the STEM stuff, helps with stuff that, you know, will be hopefully useful in some way, shape or form or gives her options later on in life. But one of the things is that she's really good at painting, she, drawing. She's so good at it. And her mom is amazing at it. My mom is amazing at it. And my wife's mom, so my wife is super artistic. All of her costumes that she ever wore on stage, her and her mother made. They make them. Mm. Like, it's nuts. And my mm. wife is just an amazing artist. And she, she with her, 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 her drawings, she's, she's exceptional, right? And... I, I just was able to go, you know what? Let's embrace this. And when my wife and I are recording, we I'll let my daughter come in and I teach her part of the song and she sings it with us. And we're just like, let's practice music because, mm -hmm. you know, she loves it. And, and the other day when we had to record, my, my mother-in-law was, was, was feeling unwell. And so she wasn't able to help watch our daughter while my wife and I were, were doing some vocal capture tracking for my wife. And so I was like, you want to help daddy? Okay. This is the start button. <laughs> Press that, mm -hmm. and then she was and she was really into it. She had her headphones on. And she was like, really. It, it, and I think my point being is that the arts are this beautiful, overarching thing. And if we can teach people to really just dive in and love them, and love them for their richness, and to appreciate them, because like, I love what you're telling me. And and, and tonight everyone that I had kind of interviewed was just really special. Like I had three interviews tonight. The first one was a composer and he's got this thing. And, and I, I found him from, he was on Avid, uh, Avid had shared what he was doing. So what he does is he does the sounds of a city. And so he mixes sounds, atmospheric sounds with like he's a, he's like an, you know, like a classically trained composer. And so he has the sounds of Kyoto. So he's out there with a mic capturing the sounds of bamboo trees hitting against each mm. other. And then he mixes that in with vocals and sounds of the city, cars honking to create this symphonic experience. It's really interesting. He did the sounds mm. of Kyoto, the sounds of, of Vladivostok. He's got a bunch of them that he's, he's a couple of them that he's done. And, and but he was like, again the idea of he's incorporating all of these different things into an artistic experience and then the the guy that i interviewed after that was a dop who was originally a musician and he was like bringing music into you know into the cinematic arts and then you trained as a painter and also an electrician and now you're building this amazing <laughs> gear it's like my point being is that you don't have to be that guy who spent 10,000 hours on a piano. If you are, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you got to honor your journey and this lean in, lean into whatever it is that starts working. You know, like right now with my daughter, well, while I'm homeschooling the next year, she loves singing. She is just like my wife and myself and super ADD. I try to get her on the piano or guitar. It's a challenge, <laughs> but she loves singing. She's got three generations of vocalists and her grandmother and her mom, you know, amazing vocalist. Lean into it, you know? Kids got that built in. Yeah. It's there, you know, just to tap in and nurture it. It's it's interesting what you're saying. I you're you're definitely you, you and I are in the same wavelength. So I have, I don't know what it's like in, in Vietnam or Australia or whatever else, but I do know what it's like in America. 
And I will say I have become a complete non-believer in the American education system. I mean, just think about just the, the macro 10,000 foot view of what we're yeah. doing. So we take what humans do, humans learn yeah. by doing. We learn by doing, and we learn the theory along the way to figure out how to better do what we're trying yeah. to do. So what do we do with, with kids? We take them out of the real world where the real danger is, where the real learning mm -hmm. is, put them in a whitewashed room with a bunch of other people who don't know what they're talking about. And then we try and cre uh, judge teachers based upon how effective they are at getting the kids to not think that they're in the worst learning environment <laughs> possible. That's literally what school is at the core. Mm -hmm. And that's not how humans learned. It's never how they have ever learned. They've learned classically. And classical education is all about understanding the human growth and development from a phase when you're young and memorization and grammar and learning the language of things in real life is how you learn. Because you're just a sponge, you soak things yep. up. When you're moving in the middle school area, what do you do in classical education? You teach them formal Aristotelian logic. Why? So they can actually think Ask questions. and they can synthesize yeah. all of the information that they have mm -hmm. learned. And then you move into the rhetorical stage, which is, you know, middle of high school to the end of high school, which is, okay, now how do you go talk to other people about mm -hmm. this stuff? So how do you know the information that you know? So learn all about world history. I'm gonna learn mathematics. I don't start with just simply trying to, you know, learn equations. What do I do? I learn as humans learn, as humanity evolved in mathematics. So my kids will learn mathematics. They will discover it like humans yeah. discover it. Right. So that, by the, so that by the time you're done, now you can go and actually talk with people intelligently about information that is very important. And that, I mean, that is how education is supposed to happen. It's how it's happened for thousands of years of human evolution in history. And yet, what do we do today in the education system? Definitely not that. What are we smarter than, I mean, it's, it's so frustrating. And you look at the fruit of your labor and well, it's not exactly, uh, it's not, it's not exactly going the right direction. Well, if you it, ask it, me. I, I had, I had spoken uh, before we were talking about micro, Dirty Jobs, really interesting guy. And he is a huge proponent of, of uh, vocational schools, you know? And, mm -hmm. and like, that was one of the things too, is like, I'm a huge fan of certainly knowing basic mathematics is great. Knowing basic of all these things is interesting, but like if at a, there have been so many people that I interviewed that were like, when I was six, I knew that I wanted to be a musician. That's all I wanted. And from that moment, I knew it. How much, if we could hear people and truly listen to this person and going, I want to be this. Well, let's really lean in on that and validate that, you know? And, and, and paying attention to what people are good at, you know? Because Yeah, and teaching them business yes, skills yes. and teaching them that your economy is based and that your economy is based upon debt. How is it that rich people never get taxed? Well, it's because they take loans out against their holdings, which are always increasing in value. So they can just keep taking loans out. So they never see profit because debt is not profit. Servicing debt is not mm -hmm. profit either. And yet nobody in high school knows this. Even the teachers don't realize all of this. And they will stay poor or moderately successful at best for the rest of their life because they will be paying higher taxes than anybody else. Nobody teaches kids this mm -hmm. stuff. Nobody teaches kids the important things that they need to mm -hmm. know. And so my advice is, if you are in some sort of a basic schooling system where that is the norm, get out and go find a real schooling system where people are actually learning as humans should mm -hmm. be learning. It's so frustrating. I'm on a soapbox. No, it's okay. Gosh. It's okay. And, and I think, I think <laughs> what, what I think is interesting because this is something that I don't think, especially for artists, they talk about. Like, everyone talks about becoming an artist, but like not how to survive with it, not how to and thrive with mm -hmm. it, you know, because... You can yeah. make money. You can be making these smart things. And this is one of the things that I, 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 I butted up against is I, everyone told me to go make a smart choices, become a doctor, become this, but you know what? Then you're still, you know, it, maybe that is never seeing yeah, your kids. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, it, right. <laughs> making, <laughs> making the choices that, you know, but they, they still doesn't mean because you're a doctor, you know how to manage money. doesn't mean that you know how to, grow your wealth doesn't mean you know how to pursue your dreams you know it's like no yeah. i i think that you know if you could go back and give advice to your younger self what advice would you give yourself i 
Uh, invest in Bitcoin. <laughs> right, right, right. Jeez, man. Everything else in my life has been just struggling through everything. And honestly, I love where it's taken me because I love to learn. I hate school because I love to learn. Right. And I mean, I am who I am. My family's who they are. I love where I am in life. I think it's been a great life. And I look forward to the future. But man, investing in Bitcoin when it first came out would have provided a level of financial freedom that would allow me to go out and go find people and figure out ways to make their lives better. Right. Like, the, honestly, that's, that's my biggest thing is I would love to be stupid wealthy so that I could go out and fix a lot of problems with a lot of different people because I find that to be fun. I love that. I just think that would be the coolest thing in the was, world. But I can't do it without financial right. freedom. You know? Hopefully we can find that next big thing, man. I <laughs> don't know what it is, but we'll see. <laughs> you never know. Yeah. That's awesome. I like that. I um, <clears throat> I was talking to someone recently about that, that I grew up with uh, a conservative Christian background, and there was a lot of that preaching money is the root of all evil. And I was just like, I never quite understood that. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> You need it to make good things happen, right? And, you know, the church is always asking us for it. So, it obviously is not that evil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then they, then they come and say, oh, actually, it says the, lo the uh, love, love of, of money, money is the root of all. <laughs> but it was interesting because you see there are great people throughout history who've done amazing things with it, you know? And, and you see, like, you know, amazing philanthropy that's been created by it. But you have to have it. And, and so, yeah. I like that Bitcoin. <laughs> if I could pull my my it's true, back man. to the future <laughs> moment, I was watching the uh, I was watching the <laughs> Avengers with my daughter recently. Avengers Endgame, and I love how they keep like lampooning Back to the Future in that movie. <laughs> Paul Rudd's like, you know what? You mean the the sports almanac? That's not true. <laughs> it's just like, oh yeah, the sports almanac, man. But yeah, right. Bitcoin, sports yeah. almanac. Well, I appreciate it, man. I really appreciate your time today and all of all of these these yeah, nuggets man. of wisdom. So. Uh...